Thank you, Abhi, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I think uh, we've been doing quarterly trainings on digit for quite a while now, and uh, last time, uh, I think last quarter, we did not do a re uh, training specifically because of the number of participants who were interested in it, but after the entire NIUA institutionalization, uh, you will be looking at more partners being interested in pan-state implementation opportunities and hence uh, the need for training on digit. So today will be, so this is the entire structure of the trainings that we will be doing. And at any point during any of these sessions, if you have any questions or queries, you can obviously directly raise it to us or write it to us. So today's session uh, will be focusing on digit implementation overview. We'll be looking at the structure of eGov, uh, what digit exactly is, and giving you an overview of how our programs on technical teams or technical enablement works. Then we have specific sessions on the platforms on how do we use DevOps for Digit and product demos and how do you extend the microservices based architecture of Digit. And then we'll be taking you through a case study as part of the entire training. So depending on uh, your role, I think you can sign up for multiple of these trainings and you would have already seen the link for sign up on these. So jumping to today's session, today's will be focusing on four key aspects in the session, giving you an, so I am part of the partnerships team. I look after the technology partnerships here at eGov. I'll give you an eGov and digit overview. Uh, Omkar, who's part of our program team, will give you a program, program governance overview. How do we work with states and partners and how do we enable partners on program implementation through their program journey? Elzan, who's uh, part of our enablement team, she'll be walking you through the people prerequisites. So to roll out a digit implementation, what are the kind of skill sets would you be requiring from your team so that you're able to manage an implementation? And we'll be looking at infra prerequisites from Ashutosh. So during the session, if you have any questions and queries, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A box, and I'll be happy to address it post my session, and I think each of the individual trainers will be doing the same. So before I get into overview of eGov, I want to understand this. So I'll be launching a poll. So idea is to understand if you have already worked with Digit, if you've heard of Digit, and what specifically would you want to take away from this session? So if you can quickly answer this. I'll just leave this open for 10 more seconds. I think we have answers from almost 70% of the participants. And I'll close this poll off. Hope you've recorded your answers. So I'll just share the results. I think it will be interesting for you to see as well. So most of the audience here has heard of Digit has either interacted with me or the product team at eGov, but never actually got a chance to work on Digit as well. So it's a fair mix. In that sense, I think this session will be quite useful to most of you. Uh, we will be covering how does it is implementation works. We will get into the functional details. I think demo will be covered as part of the two specific sessions where we'll be doing demo of four sessions. Deployment will be covered as part of the DevOps session if you're specifically interested in that. And we are doing separate sessions for configuration customization as well. So from the results, I can see that most of the sessions will be useful for you. And if we don't, we're not able to cover any specific questions or queries you have, you can obviously always directly write out to us as well. And most of you would have our email IDs. If not, we'll also put them off in the chat window at the end of the session. So I'll just walk you through a uh, overview of eGov. Most of you would already know we are a nonprofit organization which was started back in 2003. We started to work specifically on the urban go governance domain. And in the recent time, we have transitioned from focusing just on urban to launching other missions as well. 
So it was started by Nandan Nelkani, who most of you would already know of, and Shrikan Nadamuni, who was the CTO of Aadhaar. Uh, we have a team of trustees as well. And because we're a non-profit, we don't charge any revenue from any of our partners or state governments. Hence, we are mostly funded by philanthropies. So as I said, we started off on the urban journey back in 2003. Uh, and we scaled, our, we built the digit platform ourselves and we did the initial implementations. This is the way that we work. We would be doing an exemplar uh, across and doing a pan state implementation. And then the same solution will be implemented across multiple states by other SIs or partners. So you can see this is the current footprint of where digit is. And I think one West Bengal pan state has already started under the purview of another partner. Uh, but you can see the footprint of Digit. Digit is already either live or being in process of getting live across 2,500 ULBs. And there are 4,700 urban local bodies in India. And I'll talk at the end about institutionalization and the work that we're doing with ministry directly so that we're able to digitize all the 4,500 plus ULBs in India. As I said, initially, uh, we were primarily focused on urban when we started off. But from there, we have now converged to launching new platforms as well. So we are also working in sanitation, health, and public finance uh, domains as well. So we basically build the digital public infrastructure for all of these platforms. And the basic underlying layer is called digit. And on top of digit sit these different platforms. So there is something called as digit urban. The platform in sanitation uh, is called Disha. We, in health, we have built a credentializing platform, uh, which is at the back end of COVID to generate certificates, which is called DIVOC. And in public finance, we are in the process of designing and solving for this via, again, an exemplar, as I said, which is the initial implementation that we do in Punjab. So we are working across all of these different missions, building public digital infrastructure. At the same time, also, working with different ecosystem players to create capability and skill set within the organizations, the skill set that we don't currently possess. So as I said, we don't just create the digital public goods or, or the public infra, which is an op open source platform. We also work with multiple actors across the ecosystem. So we will be working with civil society partners. We will be working directly with governments, both state and central government. And we work actively with market participants as well, which is, I think most of you would have interacted with me in reference to this. At the same time, we also work on enabling policies, standards, and working with anchor institutes, which is what we've identified and done in case of urban as well. So as you can see, it's not just limited to building the product and implementing the product, but looking at the end-to-end -end ecosystem so that you're focusing on ease of living of citizens in India. At the end of the day, that's what we are aiming to do. How do you improve the ease of living for citizens in India and broadly in the Southeast Asia as well, which is where we are expanding right now. And we can talk about that later as well. So just giving a glimpse of the uh, clients that we have worked with, the government stakeholders that we have worked with. So we've gotten good traction and feedback from most of our government stakeholders and you would see similar feedback from most of the implementation partners or PMU partners that we have worked with in the past as well. So now getting into the platform specifics. So Digit itself is a microservices based architecture platform, right? So it has the core data infrastructure layer. Uh, so these are the same registries which will end up getting used by different applications or different applications in the platform itself. Then you have core services. If you look at Android, you will have different registries, different things like let's say camera service and camera service could be used by multiple apps within the Android. Similarly, different applications that you build for municipal will end up using the same core services and the same data registry because there is a huge overlap between the kind of registries and the services that you use. Let's say you're building a new application or new module on top of digit from scratch, you would not have to build out the entire system uh, by your own because you will end up reusing the existing 60 to 70% of the services to build out a completely new module. Hence, this is where I think the power of the platform or power of digit comes into play 
so that you don't have to build the entire application end to end from scratch. So if I specifically talk about Digit, it has been built keeping in mind the federated architecture of India because initially it was built for India. Uh, there are standard open APIs. It is integrable with all the different systems. And I will talk about the different implementations that we've done where this has been done. It is scalable at speed. Uh, and we have other initiatives around open data also going around. And we also work with multiple channel partners. So we have launched WhatsApp as a channel to improve citizen service delivery. BBPS is used to pay property tax bill in Uttarakhand. This is a, again an extension on top of digit and similarly we also work with last mile organizations someone like a re benefit which is a non-profit who also enable better citizens delivery so we don't focus on the solution or the implementation per se but we look at how do you improve access and ease of living for citizens as well so this is a broader roadmap this is why the kind of work that we're able to do as a non-profit specifically talking about the urban platform these are the different applications that the current urban platform has. And these are again, reference applications which have been built by eGov and all of these are open sourced. So you can find uh, the code base for this and you can then uh, customize and implement these in context of a specific implementation, which could be for an urban local body or could be for a state. So even when you think about the applications that we picked initially, they cover 90% of citizen transactions and 80% of the revenue streams of an urban local body. That's the way that we pick these applications. Another factor besides ease of living was looking at ease of doing business. So this is why I think a lot of state governments also preferred leveraging digits. So a uh, lot of the applications that we have, if you look at trade license or NOC directly impact the EODB or business reform action plan guidelines. This is why I think we got a lot of demand in the last two, three years from a lot of states as well to get implementation, digit implementation rolling. And as I talked about the uh, microservices based architecture, these are the reference applications that we have. But when you look at implementations, what you see on the right, these are two different implementations, I think done by a few of the folks who would be here on the call as well. So the different applications that you see, worth and death, pension, property mutation, unified portal, these were built by the implementation partner on top of the base vanilla implementation platform which exists so the ease of extension of digit is another reason why a system integrator would end up uh, leveraging digit instead of building something from scratch or repurposing any other existing solution in the market i talked about what ego is what the digit platform is i think one thing that I also mentioned initially was the fact that we work actively across all the actors in the ecosystem. This is where we are able to create differentiated value for the citizen at the end of the day. So we work across partners in Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. Uh, this is how we categorize our partners and we'll be working directly with state governments, multilaterals, policy think tanks. We'll be working with last mile implementation agencies, BCC intervention agencies, and all of these work across different uh, missions with us. And we'll also be working with Bazaar partners who will be SIs or PMUs or will be technology partners. Like you can see a few of the GIS players who are here as well, WhatsApp as well, to ensure that what is being built uh, is leveraged by the ecosystem at the end of the day, because we as eGov can only build the base open source solution. So these are the different partners that we work with and how do we work with technical partners, we enable them on the platform. So we work with them through program governance and Omkar will be talking specifically about the program uh, piece as well today. We also technically enable any partner when they're doing pan state implementation. We have our documentation and templates, which you would have referenced in most of our documentation site, which is the link I think me or Abhi will end up sending. And we also do technical workshop, let's say, your scope of implementation is limited to two modules of digit where you have to integrate with three other existing modules. We will also be doing technical workshops specific to the module that uh, a partner would be implementing. And then we also help with other technical queries. So it's more of an enablement and advisory role that eGov plays besides building the platform itself. And we do quarterly releases for our platform so that uh, you are upgraded with, let's say, the latest 
features or changes which get introduced every time. And I think we're going to be doing a release webinar a uh, week, week and a half from now as well, in which we'll be looking at 2.6. What are the different new features that we have come up with? So what impact does this create for an SI or a partner? This is uh, the slide which talks about it. So I talked about the enablement that we do, right? So we work with multiple implementation partners. We put in a lot of training hours and the training that we're doing right now is also part of that. Uh, we do, our documentation is fairly comprehensive, which is what you would have seen on the platform as well. And then we also create a lot of enablement videos for different players. And you can see how partners have had success implementing solutions, leveraging Digit. So you will see new application being built in six, day, six weeks to let's say entire OBPS uh, going pan state live in 55 days, which is something in GovTech domain has not been seen before. The speed and scale with which implementation partners are able to get these applications live. Uh, I'm going to skip over the case studies. I mean, this talks about, again, the speed at which implementations have happened in the past. Punjab is one use case where we were able to get 100 urban local bodies live in 90 days. And Uttarakhand is an, uh, another example where I think Digit is implemented. And we, as I said, we also work directly with the state government. So we get sponsorship from the highest level. Hence, you see uh, here like CM Trivendra Singh Rawat uh, launching Digit. And same is true for each Havni, Odisha. So we will be directly working with the state uh, stakeholders as well to ensure that a pan state implementation is rolled out for Digit. Um, just going to skip over this and talk at the end about institutionalization. As I said, we as eGov were only able to scale to, let's say, a limited number of state. Uh, now we are directly in partnership with Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, who has instituted Center for Digital Governance, which is under NIUA to enable digital transformation across 4,500 plus ULBs in India. So now the idea is for national urban governance platform for which Digit has been uh, chosen to be rolled out or integrated across 4,500 ULBs in India. And this is the way at which we are able to achieve scale. And uh, a panelment for this is already on. I think you would have, most of you would have submitted bids for this. So you will see uh, pan state rollout RFPs also com coming out, I think, in a few months after the entire empanelment process is done. So this was the overview of Digit, eGov, and the different missions that we're working on. If there are any questions, I can take them up right now. Okay, anything like, I don't see any questions. Uh, okay, I think I have a hand raised, one second. Hi, Subhisachi. Yeah, hi, so I have a question here. Regarding the RFPs that you were talking about, so would, mm -hmm. would you be informing the partners about this or the, or the partners would be doing it on their own? So uh, NIUA has, I mean, the RFE process, they are empaneling partners who will be able to implement uh, NUGP. Post this empaneling process is done, it will be a closed RFP floated to all the empaneled partners. So that is the way it will be between NIUA and the partners themselves we are still in enablement we will be enabling the partners on digit but the rfp itself will be managed directly by niua okay fine thank you yeah it'll be niua in conjunction with the state because it will be for a pan state rollout so thanks okay Perfect. If there is nothing else, and you can always drop any questions to me as well here in the chat window, uh, I will give it off to Omkar, who will pick up the second part of the session. Hey, thanks, Ajay. Uh, am I audible? 
Yeah, you are audible. Okay. I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible, Ajay? Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Omkar. Uh, I work as a program manager with uh, Eager Foundation. Uh, I've, I've been part of uh, some of the implementations we've done uh, either uh, direct, directly as Eager or uh, also with uh, some of our uh, prominent partners. So I'll, I'll be talking about a program governance piece. So, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a brief session, uh, just how we uh, have worked with uh, uh, governments uh, and various uh, 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 government bodies and partners before. Uh, so uh, one thing, so this is, this is not something which is uh, uh, prescriptive as such. So this is basically our experience, which I, I'll be sharing. So uh, uh, there will definitely be some uh, tweaks and customizations required for this uh, piece based on the, the program, the project or the initiative. And then uh, they, are, they are obviously expected to be done at the time of a program setup. But what, what I'll be sharing is the way we have set up governance in some of our initiatives and uh, uh, how, how we've kind of benefited from them. So uh, with that, I'll begin. So, so uh, when when we are talking of a digit rollout in a state, so uh, while I mean while it's it's also a technology uh, implementation initiative uh, because of its nature, uh, uh, I mean because of digit's nature uh, of being a platform. So that there are certain other aspects which are involved here as well, right? So one uh, prominent aspect is uh, uh, digital okay. transformation, uh, where uh, some of the local bodies or some of the departments might be going online for the first time. That is one. So uh, because of this, uh, it, it also offers an uh, opportunity to do some standardization, process re-engineering, uh, as well as optimization in overall processes, which might have been running for quite some time. So uh, that, that, that that's one. Second is it, it uh, allows... Uh, one second, Omkar. Can you make it full screen? Sorry? Uh, can you make it full screen? I think it was asked from, you can just increase the size of the slide maybe. Cool. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, continuing where I left off. So uh, apart from uh, this digital transformation piece, it also uh, gives an opportunity for uh, various uh, 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 connected entities and departments to kind of uh, streamline their engagement with the host department, which is uh, doing this uh, rollout implementation. And then, uh, obviously, there are there are there is the core objective of uh, I mean core program objective, which are it might be increasing revenues, improving delivery of services to citizens, uh, or just maybe digitizing some services and so on and so forth. Right. So uh, once the, the, the program objective is set up, uh, what we normally uh, recommend is a governance structure is put in place to kind of drive the program, okay? So this is a brief overview of how uh, the proposed governance structure looks like, okay? So uh, 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 briefly touching back on what I said, because this is not just a, a technology, uh, implementation, uh, but it's, it's also a proper uh, opportunity for a digital transformation uh, activity. Uh, while we focus on technology as one piece, but we also focus heavily on domain advisory and program management as, as an equally important piece. Okay, uh, so uh, what, what this normally uh, helps in is, uh, I mean, while technology can go out there, uh, it also kind of helps the uh, the government in managing the technology well, right? So technology, I mean, just, just putting out technology uh, can't be an objective. It, it has, I mean, the technology needs to be managed. It needs to be used. Uh, it needs to be adopted by all the players in the ecosystem. And then the whoever is doing that rollout needs to kind of realize uh, the benefit of that technology, right? So uh, so the, the, the structure which we normally propose is uh, setting up of a steering committee. Uh, this steering committee mainly comprises of uh, senior bu bureaucrats and leaders from relevant entities. Uh, this uh, steering committee, like the name suggests, is responsible for the overall uh, direction setting in the program, as well as overall success of the program. Uh, the unit below this uh, is a program management unit. 
so this is ideally in 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 context of urban development departments or dma uh, directorate of municipal administrations uh, the departments we have normally worked with so uh, in in uh, such context this is normally set up at the department level uh, which uh, is headed by the director of the department their team and then program management resources from the relevant entities right and this is the unit which is actually responsible for the execution of the program and then uh, this one important piece of this uh, uh, program management unit is of course the implementation partners who who probably uh, uh, not sorry not probably sorry who give the necessary muscle and the the implementation muscle and the capacity for that government to uh, uh, execute this right uh apart from these three main blocks uh, there are two floating uh, committees uh, which we've set up seen good benefits and thus we normally recommend so one is a committee on uh, technology advisory and second one is a committee on domain advisory right so as as the name suggests uh, the uh, technology advisory committee advises uh, steering committee and pmu on long term uh, technology strategy as well as best practices whereas the domain advisory committee advises uh, uh steering committee and pmu on uh, aspects like policy reform uh, strategy and uh, best practices and uh, core domain aspects right uh getting into the uh, detailed composition uh, subjects and frequency of these uh, entities so uh, the steering committee like i said it it, it will uh, normally be led by the program sponsor uh, we work with uh, uh various uh, senior bureaucr bureaucrats including uh, secretaries or principal secretaries for urban uh as well as uh, senior secretaries from the government of india uh the, there are directors of the implementation uh, agency uh, who are also part of this the the partner or program lead from uh, the implementation partner also has a seat on this uh we normally are part of uh, a steering committees where uh, the the state requests us to be and then there are other state representatives uh, whom the state uh things are necessary uh, they might be experienced representatives from the government people who have seen other similar uh, initiatives and so on and so forth uh, so uh, normally the government invites such uh, people to uh, uh, sit on the chair group right the subjects which uh, uh, this committee deals with uh, like i said include uh, vision mission of the program uh, resource allocation so by resource i mainly mean uh, allocating budget and funding and uh, even manpower if it comes to that uh this this also deals with uh, policy process reforms which are required uh, as part of the rollout so like i said uh, i mean while technology can be put in place there are certain policies and uh, uh, standard uh, procedures which have been running which need to be realigned to kind of suit uh, technology which is in place now so this uh, committee oversees any such reforms uh, oversight and conflict resolution are anyways uh, part of the normal uh, uh, work of uh, this uh, committee right and then the frequency uh, i mean again this is something like i said can differ from uh, program to program but uh, ideally we recommend that uh, this uh, 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 senior group meets at least once every month uh, or as uh, called by the pmu to deliberate right the next unit uh, is the program management unit so uh, like i said before uh, this is normally led by director of the uh, implementing department uh this will have program managers from the government side as well as the the implementation partner side this will have a procurement specialist because we've seen normally that any sort of procurement so while while the budget uh, allocation might happen here the actual procurement the rfps which are to be floated the 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 people or uh, technology or whatever needs to be procured this normally happens within the department so uh, a procurement specialist finds a place here uh, and then uh, there are senior department uh, senior uh, representatives from the uh, department or uh, urban local bodies uh, who are again invited to be part of this uh, group to advise on uh, uh, best practices from their respective ulbs or maybe if they've spent a lot of time in the field so they know uh, how things happen so uh, we normally uh, invite uh, such people to uh, gain advantage of their uh, experience right and then the subjects which uh, pmu deals with include execution uh, change management so like i said uh, once once uh, technology is in place and certain reforms uh, have been uh, initialized there is a lot of change which happens normally in the way uh, uh, things operate on ground so change management becomes a very important piece uh, of the whole uh, uh, initiative 
uh, basically uh, people uh, just need to be uh, kind of supported and trained and kind of their their queries need to be resolved and so on and so forth uh, around whatever changes are happening so change management is one very important piece which uh, pmu deals with monitoring and evaluation um, is another important piece where uh, the the department monitors uh, and understands whether the technology which they've rolled out is being adopted or not uh, whether there are any issues there are any uh, bottlenecks which uh, the users might be facing the citizens might be facing and then takes corrective action for uh, such bottlenecks to be resolved uh, troubleshooting escalation and procurement is something we have already discussed so pmu uh, we ideally recommend meets weekly uh, or as frequently as needed for the program right uh going on uh, the next uh, two uh, units uh, which i mentioned earlier uh, one was a technology advisory committee so uh, this uh, includes a technology or it uh, head from the state uh, representation uh, representatives from the pmu uh, again we normally are part of technology advisory committee because we are the uh, platform owners and uh, uh, supporters and then uh, we've seen uh, other departments play a very prominent role in uh, these large rollouts so departments like state data centers nic uh, treasury uh, as well as maybe even local uh, academia and so on and so forth so uh, uh, such representatives add a lot of uh, uh, depth and experience from their respective domains uh, to the work which is being done right Uh, the technology advisory committee deals with uh, subjects like uh, infrastructure which is required to host the platform uh, integrations so because digit is an integrated platform uh, with open apis you will anyways learn that in the subsequent sessions so there is there is a good possibility that uh, uh, it might be integrated with any external uh, uh, agencies or departments so uh, we have we have integrated with uh, uh, bbps we have integrated with uh, nic's uh, birth and death in ap we have integrated with uh, bhu aadhar and so on so there are a lot of integrations which have happened on uh, top of digit so this this is the committee which plays a key role in deciding the strategy for these integrations how they should work and uh, and then how how should they kind of materialize uh, architectural realignment is again an important piece uh, so Uh, 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 while during the rollout uh, in case there are any uh, policy changes or there are any uh, uh, big uh, reforms which are required there is certain architectural realignment which might be needed in the platform so uh, this committee uh, takes care of any such uh, uh, areas and then obviously release planning when uh, when does what gets released to the end users so the frequency for this uh, again uh, we recommend that it meets every fortnightly or then again as convened by pmu or the steering committee coming to the last piece uh, domain advisory committee deals with uh, like the name suggests it deals with uh, uh, core domain so uh, this consists of uh, domain or subject matter experts from the government uh, this in, again includes senior representatives from the uh, implementing agencies uh, ulbs or uh, departments this include this uh, in some cases might also include external consultants so uh, we have seen this happening in some of the public finance management initiatives uh, we are working with where uh, the the government might uh, feel a need to invite external consultants who can advise the government on uh, uh, process reengineering and specialized uh, areas and then this can also include some uh, local representatives from academia the the topics or subjects which uh, this committee deals with include things like policy reforms uh, standardization uh, this committee also uh, finalizes the actual business requirements which come in and then exception handling so i'll i'll uh, uh, focus a bit more on the business requirements piece so uh, like i said because uh, digits nature as an integrated platform there there is certain amount of standardization which is expected anyways as part of the rollout okay so uh, this committee acts as a filter and as a as a, uh, a keeper of the uh, conscience for uh, all requirements which come in from the ground so they come to the domain advisory committee and then the domain advisory committee will deliberate and kind of uh, provide a re refined uh, version of business requirements for the implementation and technology teams to uh, develop and implement so they so in in such cases where exceptions might arise the domain advisory committee also plays the role of exception handling so just giving some example so uh, if if certain processes are changing which are applicable only in certain ulbs or in in maybe certain tenants then the domain advisory committee will provide with workarounds which those uh, ulbs or those 
uh, tenants can use uh, in order to adopt the system a little better. So th those are the kind of uh, areas which uh, the domain advisory committee deals with. So the frequency of uh, convening this is again, ideally every fortnightly or as frequently as convened by the PMU or steering committee, right? So yeah, I think that that's uh, it uh, from uh, my side. Uh, I'll, I'll pause for any questions if there are. Meanwhile, while the questions pop in, Unka, do you also want to do the poll on what governance sure. structures currently are being followed? Sure, sure. One second. I launched the poll to understand if you've seen similar governance structures before or not. Meanwhile, if you have any questions with respect to uh, program or Steerco and or the kind of program advisory that we do to our partners as well, please put them in the chat window or the Q&A. We'll be happy to pick any of those. Gonna wait for 10 more seconds. I think we have 70% folks who responded. Meanwhile, while this happens, I'm actually surprised that we haven't gotten any questions because I think last time then when we did these sessions, there were quite a few questions. So either uh you know a lot about digit already, or maybe this is going over. Here. So I'll just end the quote. So I think most of the teams uh, have seen a similar structure in terms of program advisory. Omkar, maybe you also want to talk about uh, how we specifically also engage with both the governments and uh the partner themselves to assist them in uh, program governance i think that will be useful for others to understand sure uh, uh before that I, i'll just conclude the earlier piece so uh, while the other trainers will also focus on this uh, 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 there, there's a there's a docs.digit.org which is our uh, open source portal where uh, a lot of our content is uh, hosted so i'm just sharing the link uh, in the chat here for the deck which we just saw. Okay. Uh, with that, I will uh, move on. So, uh, yeah, uh, 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 about Ajay's point. So there, there are two modes of engagement. The way we've uh, uh, previously worked uh, 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 in programs. So uh, one is uh, direct to state engagements, or the second one is either through. Uh, a partner, uh, so that partner can be either government or uh, market. Uh, that is one. Second is the the uh, the type of advisory which we normally do revolves around uh, best practices, which uh, best practices from implementations we have been part of and sharing of uh, 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 stuff which works normally, uh, helping partners identify pain points, areas where uh, normally there are bottlenecks and so on and so forth. That is one. Second is uh, we uh, will also uh, advise uh, our partners on things like team structure and the capability of uh, uh, people uh, or resources who are required to uh, implement digit. And then uh, uh, the third part is uh, obviously we are, we are working with various departments on various specific programs. So there's, there's advisory which is done as part of those uh, specific programs as well. So that is more uh, context specific, right? So yeah, I think I think those are our modes of engagement and the way we normally uh, operate uh, on program advisory. Thank you for that, Omkar. If there are any specific queries with respect to this, I think we can pick it up now. Or if any questions come up during the sessions, we can take them at the end as well. Uh, meanwhile, I would want to invite Elzan. Uh, who leads the entire enablement effort from eGov. 
so any time there is a technical enablement which needs to be done for any specific implementation for a partner this is where elza and team will uh, come into play and help the program with technical advisory and the basic enablement which needs to be done for the scope for which the pro- uh, the partner needs to implement uh, the solution for the client so give it off to azan she will walk you through the prerequisite from a people point of view that you need uh, to leverage digit and implement it thank you ajay good afternoon everyone just let me share my screen yeah uh, ajay you can flash the first poll Yeah. Just give it 10 more seconds. Alzan you can see the results right <laughs> close to 46 percentage people are aware of microservice which is a good thing right yeah so um, as ajay mentioned uh, my team takes care of the technical enablement both uh, from a, a general induction to the detailed training so we do the detailed training whenever there is a a, a particular module if a partner wants to implement in a state or in a smart city we'll do in depth training also so this is just covering the basic aspects of digit and the basic prerequisites uh, from a people software and hardware perspective so yeah to start with <clears throat> so the technical prerequisites a skill set of the development team so i've just bifurcated into development team and devops team so development team uh, they should be well versed with open apis using swagger is the tool which we are using for uh, designing the apis uh, so rest apis and open api concepts those has to be clear then uh, json is something that we use for communication both front end back end uh, as well as defining the master data everything is in json format so that is important postman is the tool which we are using for uh, api testing and um, all sorts of uh, data loading and things like that anything that you do with the api we use the postman postgres is the database tool uh, database management uh, uh, software that we are using uh, it's open source so yeah but it will work with other uh, uh, databases as well we use postgres uh, then java that's a basic so our entire code base is purely in java and rest apis then uh, basics of elastic search so elastic search is uh, used for uh, dashboarding and reporting you can use it further also in search and uh, open searches and stuff like that uh, but mostly we have used it for dashboarding and reporting so all the data um, as part of being pushed to database it is being pushed to the elastic search as well so again these are all configuration things you may wish not to have it also maven is the uh, tool for build and deploy so spring boot spring boot application because you know it's a microservice uh, uh, architecture that we are following so everything is a small spring boot application kafka is the event management tool that we are using uh, basic concept of what we are using here is asynchronous transactions so um, whichever can go asynchronous is taken in an asynchronous way and everything is managed through the event queue using kafka zool is the api gateway which we are using uh, then coming to node js and react js so fr- for front end we are actively using react js but for uh, a poc we have done node js also just to 
uh, show you that like irrespective of whatever is the uh, framework, Digit will support. So most of the modules are built on React.js. WordPress and PHP we are using for the portal. So we have a sample, uh, a templatized web portal, I would say, which you can take and customize, configure for the state or the uh, ULB which you are implementing. So it's coming as part of the digit offering. Uh, but if you have to uh, further uh, enhance it and do something more, then you will have to know how to manage use the WordPress and PHP. So uh, that's the basic skill set required for a developer, the development team basically. Yeah. Coming to the DevOps, so since it's a microservice architecture, the DevOps team is very important. And in EGov, uh, we, we have the developers also having a minimum uh, set of a minimum skill set of DevOps also because everything cannot be uh, always relied on DevOps team because it's so much of uh, uh, so many services and tracking of logs and all of that like minimum uh, certain things in this even the development team will need to know but from an expertise point of view these are expected out of a DevOps team. So understanding of microservice architecture, yeah, that is important for both the teams. <clears throat> and then um, our digit is uh, agnostic to the environment. So it will work on AWS, Azure, State Data Center, NIC Cloud, anywhere. So it doesn't matter. It can be configured and deployed anywhere. We promote uh, cloud because it's easy to manage and monitor. <clears throat> Even scaling up and scaling down is much uh, easier in uh, all these commercial clouds. Then strong understanding of Linux commands, the spinning of VM, networking, storage. These are the basic requirements like any DevOps person should know. Then Kubernetes <coughs> is what we are using. So we have the basic uh, installation kit and things like that. So they should know how to spin up uh, an instance using the Terraform uh, that is being uh, given as part of uh, our deliverable. So then managing that further is something that uh, your team will need to do. But we have certain, um, I would say like Golang script and stuff like that, which comes as handy. So first time setup and all should not take time. But overall managing it in the long run, you will need to have a good handle on a Kubernetes, Terraform and things like that. <clears throat> Coming to, uh, yeah, understanding of VM types, Linux OS, load balancer. These are basic things like firewall, routing, all of that. Like any, any infrastructure guys should be able to manage that. Uh, Setting up of uh, CI, CD, uh, continuous integration and deployment pipeline, we're using Jenkins. <clears throat> you can use any other tool, but uh, we, we use Jenkins and we promote Jenkins. Um, and there also we have uh, jobs and all uh, tools created to uh, make things like uh, to set up your build scripts and all very easy. There are certain um, things that comes handy we have certain tools already done on top of Jenkins. <clears throat> then for scripting, uh, we use Python, Golang, I al already mentioned. Then uh, experience in uh, making container and dockers. And finally, everything is a Docker image for us. All the services will have a Docker image and these Docker images are what gets published. Then <clears throat> Nexus, Docker Hub, these are the places where all the artifacts are being stored. So you may wish to keep wherever you want. Uh, then ingress SSL certificate, certificate renewal. So for the domain and the IPs, which uh, you are, uh, you're being the domains that you're creating that might need an SSL certificate and that has to be renewed yearly and stuff like that. So managing of those things yeah, Zool Gateway already covered. Uh, yeah, 
managing of git is something i would say very important for a devops person because uh, we have multiple even though it is a single git repo you might have different branches and different pull requests coming in and then you have a customization probably a different repo for customization so managing all these branches and repositories and frequently uh, like uh, forking it merging it so a good um, handle on how to manage the git and the review processes and the uh, setting up of rules basically if uh, some code has to cannot be pushed without a review process you will have to configure that in your git repo so those things the devops person will have to uh, do that and configure in your own git repo experience in helm packaging and deployment so helm helm file is something a configuration kind of file what we use for easy deploy so it, you just need to configure all your uh, configurations in one uh, yaml file and then helm will take care of deploying it and uh, spinning up the environment accordingly then uh, jboss whitefly apache ingress redis postgres okay these are the uh, things which we uh, use for uh, the back application server and database so i've already covered that yeah any any doubt in uh, the skill sets before i move on to the hardware <coughs> sorry i have a bad throat you can continue as well okay <clears throat> okay coming to the hardware prerequisite uh, because this is um, uh, i would say memory intensive application and like we have about like 50 odd services so uh, deploying all these services in a local box will not work so you should have a server where all the services are being hosted and for a developer uh, we recommend uh, to have a 16 GB RAM, preferably a Ubuntu machine. Because Windows, we have seen that things are very, works very slow. So Ubuntu is what we prefer. And uh, 16 GB RAM, why? Because uh, depending on the, uh, how many services you want to run at, a, uh, at any point of time. If you're running the whole front end, you might need this, this much. Otherwise, uh, you will feel a lag and like you can't, uh, get the uh, productivity as expected then all the developers will need to have a git id created because they will have to push their code to git using their own git ids uh, then for uh, the dev tool like eclipse or intel j whatever you're comfortable uh, then you will have to install git jdk 8 or above maven postgres elastic search uh, elastic search i already covered postman again it is it's, everything is a free tool so that's something that you, you would have noticed by now we don't use anything that is paid all the softwares hardwares everything uh, we generally go for open source <clears throat> coming to the software assets so uh, whatever i have mentioned above so we already have a artifact uh, uh, repository so this is the same link uh, Umkar has pinged you docs.digital.org. So this page is available in that open uh, website. So you can go here and see all the software uh, assets related to Git, microservice architecture, React.js. So these are some materials which we have done and some uh, common materials which we have got from the internet. So you are free to go through all of these just to get a uh, detailed view of what of each of these tools means. I'm not getting into each and everything. So I see a raised hand uh, one second. Yeah. I think it's Rajinder. One second, I'll just allow you to talk Rajinder. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hey, thank you, Ajay. Um, Thank you, Elzen. Uh, one question, uh, um, one is related to architecture. So we gone through uh, the entire like you know, architecture component which we need to build this platform. 
if we can have very high level architecture overview also that will really help us yeah. understand how these components are connected right so that's there that's part of your uh, training i think that's coming from okay right, it's going to come okay yeah that's the next session <clears throat> okay and second is on on uh, related to when you said open source i know that you know um when you say open source there are enterprise version of it and there are uh, if we're going for a production uh, uh, implementation we normally don't go for a totally free versions right we go with the enterprise version of open source and there are some uh, like you know prices attached to that um, so is it the understanding or we totally go with the uh, not really we have so far used is completely open source uh, i don't omkar uh, you can pitch in if we have done anything enterprise i am not aware of anything as such no no no, no i can we, we have just uh, open source uh, version only so the so uh, uh, if you check our github repo so there's a digit os as open source uh, system branch which normally holds our production ready version so that, that is the one which uh, partners and governments normally use okay we don't have an enterprise version asking why i am asking because in case we need any support say for example postgres sql right um in case we need any support we normally don't get it for freeware and until this is not an enterprise version there is small fee which is attached to every uh, enterprise version of open source so that is the reason i was asking okay so sure. yeah. so i mean uh, the reason one we are a non profit and anything that we engage on one is building the product and second doing enablement so elzan's team does the entire technical training right this also happens for free so that is enabling your team on implementing digit which is a specific training and then in terms of the support there is l3 support on the product itself which is again i can ping it's on the digit documentation as well when you look at the support component of it you can see we get into a non commercial mou with a partner again there's no fee for it so as part of the mou l3 support and slas are provided which generally is what you will get with a commercial player but because we are an open source uh, platform the code is open source uh, it is not a black box unlike any other provider so uh, you would be idea is we will give you l3 support because you are starting off as uh, let's say a new implementation agency we will support that but over times when teams get comfortable they can actually customize and configure the existing code so that they would not even end up requiring any support from us as well so that is uh, the model in which we operate we don't have a enterprise ready a separate enterprise ready system is the same open source solution which is implemented by everyone great ajay thank you thank you so we have one more question in the q and a uh, it's gone now somebody was asking a question on the hardware re prerequisites yes i think yeah, omkar answered that yeah. i've sent a link okay right. so on the support as well i've just put the link in the chat window it's the, under the same doc, docs.digit you can see the kind of support that we provide on the product on top of the training that we do again all of it is for free uh so while we go to the next session i thought it will also be useful for you to I know we put the documentation website link here, but let me just take a couple of minutes to take you through the documentation website. Or as well, uh, do you want to cover the people prerequisite as well? We can do it after that as well. I think it will be useful for them to understand how the documentation website is structured, because a lot of the questions that are asked or probably are already there in your head could be answered by something which is already posted there, because we have seen the same questions. being asked multiple times okay you want me to just glance them through the website i can do that uh, do you oh, want to yeah. go through the yeah let me do that yeah. one second i hope my it should be visible so i mean there's the partner support link uh that was there and you can look at the scope of the support that we provide which happens via non commercial mou 
Uh, so this is the documentation website, and this is only for Digit Urban. We have different documentation websites for other platforms as well. So we have one for sanitation, one for iFix, which is a public finance portal, and similarly one for Divoc, which is on health. At the end of this session, I'll be pinging you, I think, the links for everyone. But the way it's structured is you can see this is an overview of Digit. So there is an access Digit page. This is a public demo instance that you have access to. So the products and modules, when you see under the product docs, which Digit already has, this has details, feature list, functional lists, which is generally what SIs uh, would end up using as part of their uh, decks as well, right? So all the feature lists and even RFP mapping is done by partners by looking at this. And the same products and features, you can actually access the public link here. So when you can log in either as a citizen or you can generate your credentials and employ. So when you click here, submit the form, you'll get the details in your inbox for the different roles that you can play as an employer. And then you can log into the public instance and actually go through the flow as either a citizen or an employer. So this is a very useful feature to understand what functionality or modules are there in digit and even actually to go through the look and feel of how it operates uh, while you also have the features and modules handy. So this is from a functional point of view. We also are in so everything on architecture and roadmap is also here i will just take the question as well uh training resources are also there so the training that we are doing today you see it here similarly we keep doing regular sessions in training you can always access them here we take videos for example the video of this training will also end up going here and we have videos for configuration and even the workflow videos for all the modules here so this again becomes a useful repository for you to see what already exists and for you to again uh, go through the products and then club that with the training videos. Similarly, we have uh, partner support and then setup, which is what Elzan was showing you right now, right? So quick start and full installation is how do you install a specific uh, module? This is just for PGR, which is I think one of the lightest module on digit so that you're able to learn faster. And similarly, you will be able to set up on, let's say AWS, Azure, GCP. Then you can also do it on your local or uh, state instance accordingly. There are multiple tools. How do you configure CI, CD? And what Elzan was showcasing right now, right, was under the setup requirements. So under how to set up on digit, this is the page that she was taking you through, the technical requirements, skill sets which are needed. Similarly, rollout governance, infra requirements, skill requirements on DevOps, all of this is already there. And I think this becomes a single source of reference for you, everything digit. This also has details on the architecture as well. So just wanted to highlight that because uh, I know we've pinged the links here, but it becomes easier for you to reference this while I'm taking you through the structure of the site. So I hope this was useful. One second, I'll just pick up if there are any more questions. Yeah, you can put... was yeah. Had raised and so on. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Samadhyata and uh, I have a question. So uh, I was just going through the doc part of it and I see that you have specific, uh, you know, modules that you've implemented via APIs. Do you, do you also have like APIs for like, you know, government specific data or is it is it just these functional modules that 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 you kind of support on? Can you elaborate when you say government specific data, what is happening? Uh, like for instance, um, uh, now let's say some kind of financial data, it could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, RBI data, like banks, branches, you know, that kind of information, which is like very centric to the whole government ecosystem or could be um, the, uh, the state, whatever kind of information, state related information. Are Just, you talking about open data in the sense yes, what open yes. data comes from the platform? Yes. So we are in process. So as uh, you would have seen, I think Digit is being implemented by multiple partners and state agencies in multiple states, right? On top of that, Digit is also being anchored, Digit Urban, I'm specifically talking about, by Ministry Mahua directly as National Urban Governance Platform. So as part of that coming into play, which is what is happening right now, we're also looking at uh, data governance as a large piece which is one part of that is looking at how does role access between, let's say, a center, state, and a ULB 
And another part of it is open data governance. So how do you expose this data, which could be around uh, SLAs on how each independent ULB is doing uh, versus let's say the timelines of how much time does it take for you to get a trade license versus how much time does a ULB take to respond to a query. So all of these is currently being designed right now. These APIs are not available. At the same time, some specific implementations, when you talk about each Havni, for example, which is digit implementation in all the containment boards in India, they have their own open dashboards, which will give you access to these data. So currently, each implementation has its own open dashboard, but we're also trying to standardize and streamline this. So all of this data is available in one single source which is, I mean, in play. So that's going to happen in some time. Okay, thank you so much. Can you flash the poll, Ajay? There's one more, I guess. Yeah, sure. And we can hand over to Ashutosh. This is more like a quiz than a poll, but yeah, we'll go with this. I'll just close the poll in the next five seconds. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ajay. We can move on with the Shitosh session now. So I think before we do that, uh, I know we've gone through the entire skill set of Digit. I also thought it will be useful for you to get a glimpse of uh, what resources would you need for an entire implementation? I think we've talked about the technology stack that a DevOps resource or a technical resource uh, would need to implement on digit. But maybe this also will be useful, I think, for most of the program folks. Uh, is my screen visible? I think it should be. Yeah. Elzan, you want to quickly walk over this once? Yeah, I can go through this. So yeah, high level, we will need a project manager, somebody with the 10 years experience who have managed big projects, uh, particularly in the governance domain, that'd be a plus point. Then we need tech manager, uh, minimum one tech manager with eight plus years experience, who has hands-on Java experience, who knows how, how to implement REST APIs and have the entire idea of this microservice architecture. Then we have, uh, we need uh, senior software engineers. Uh, again, it depends on like how many modules you are implementing, the count will be like two or three, depending on that. Uh, tech skill set is uh, same like Java, Linux, Kibana. So Kibana is the tool where uh, we do the dashboarding. Then we uh, Postgres Core Java. So these both for senior engineer and junior engineer, the technical skill sets remain same. Just the number of uh, engineers uh, keep changing a little bit. Then we, we need a dedicated QA team. So this is what I have seen state team lagging most of the time. They just, uh, just the developers test stuff and then they put on uh, UAT and stuff like that. That will not work. You need to have a experienced QA person because see there are certain things like API testing uh, kit that we give, performance benchmarking that we give. So all of these has to be verified in your environment and make sure that it's working as per the standard that, uh, so Digit publish a certain standard, okay, for 300 transaction, we need these, these, these things and it should work in these milliseconds. So this will, you have to verify in your environment using the scripts that is being offered. 
So and the scripts may not work as is because you would have customized a little bit. So that extra customization you might have to do to your test scripts. So that's where a QA engineer, uh, um, a good QA engineer, one person should be enough if uh, he or she is uh, able to manage both functional as well as the automation testing. Uh, then data migration specialist is something very important. Again, uh, it depends on how many modules you want to migrate the data, say like water connections, sewerage connections, properties. So depending on the number of uh, ULVs you are going live and the number of registries you are planning to migrate, the number of people also depends on that. And uh, this person has to have a good knowledge on the data model which Digit is proposing and what data we are gathering using the Excel sheet or whatever for. Um, make sure that the, the data formats are all aligned, all mandatory data are collected, things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, DevOps lead, I have already mentioned the importance of the DevOps team, I would say, instead of one lead. You may need more than one person, again, depending on how many services and how many environments you are going to manage. Uh, minimum, I would say you will have three environments, one for the development, one for the QA or UAT, and one for production. So uh, we have four environments, dev, QA, UAT, production. You may opt to have like three or I would say minimum three is required. Uh, and depending on that, you will have to have as many number of people also in your DevOps team. Senior business analyst uh, is, we are saying somebody with five years, five years plus experience who can understand and outline the problems and get the data the way the system wants. So same junior and senior, you might need more and more people based on how many modules you are parallelly going like. So you're going one after the other, maybe you can have like one senior, one junior, that should be fine. But two, three modules like property, water, no pass, all the three, if you want to go live together and all development happening together, you might need more people. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Perfect, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, if there are any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box in the chat window. I think we can take the top at the end of the session as well. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to invite Ashutosh if we can take you through the infra prerequisites, I think we talked about from a software and implementation and a program point of view, what kind of resources and skill sets that you need. Ashutosh will focus more on the infra bit for a digital implementation. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, one second, Ajay. Before that, I think there's a question from Catherine. Can Digit migrate to a different RDBMS other than Postgres SQL? Yeah, it should. It should work. It's agnostic to whatever RDBMS. But you might need to see all the uh, queries you will have to relook, and the Hello. syntaxes might need to Hello. be corrected. That's it. Thank you, Aljan. Hope that answers, Catherine. Yeah, we can go out. Hi, everyone. Uh, my voice is audible. Hello. Yeah. Sure. yeah. This is my script. One second. Yeah, my screen is visible, right? Yep. Uh, Ajay, can you please pass the poll? I can see your screen. Uh, are you opening something else? Yeah, can you please flash the poll one? Oh, yeah, sure. One second.
just going to wait five more seconds. So while the poll is happening, do you think we can take that question which is on the board uh, by Sumit Chetri? Is there a standard or a recommended minimum spec on the team size required for a given ULB or a deployment in terms of tech versus functionality? So I think uh, on this, I can pick that up. So there is a bare minimum requirement in terms of the number of people that you would need, which would be for, if you take the bare requirement, it would be for, let's say one ULB PGR. PGR is, I think, the lightest module if you want to take that. So we can uh, put the specs out. And I think it should be also there on the doc side in terms of what does it take to implement that. And then depending on the scope, which could be in terms of the number of modules. If you're going from a PGR to a finance, which will also require data migration. If you are looking at other modules, so the team size will increase and also depending on the scope, if it's a pan state implementation, managing, managing that means you need to have a dedicated PMU and a lot of program resources and functional resources who are trained in let's say finance or property tax who can help you with those specific requirements. So answer is it depends basically. Uh, we'll answer the questions I think after this session. Uh, Ashutosh, I think you can pick up the session. Yeah. The uh, so discuss about infra requirements. Uh, this page is uh, discuss about the infra requirement for our digit service. Uh, in our digit service, we use Kubernetes as a containerization and deploy <laughs> the requirements of uh, the uh, basic. So uh, the basic requirements for our application, we use Kubernetes because the benefits of using Kubernetes is it is a open source and uh, it has multi-cloud capability and uh, Kubernetes work with virtually and uh, type of container runtime. And right now Kubernetes is a market leader. Uh, we use uh, the Kubernetes, which is open source containerization, uh, containerization orchestration platform that helps in abstracting a variety of infra types and available across each state, like uh, physical VMs, uh, on premises cloud like VMware, OpenStack, and uh, commercial cloud like uh, Google, AWS, and Azure. Uh, also used for SDC and NIC into standard infra type. Uh, digit becomes a uh, uh, the single type of infrastructure and first digit becomes a multi-cloud supported and portable, extendable and high performance and scalable containerization workload and services. Uh, the basic needs of provision, uh, provision of Kubernetes cluster, like you use two type of cluster. Uh, one is master and uh, second one is user or worker cluster. Okay, uh, for master cluster, we uh, need three type, uh, three or more machines like uh, Linux, we using Linux like Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, and etc. And uh, minimum requirement is 4 GB or more RAM per machine because any less will leave little room for our applications. And we need two CPUs or more uh, <clears throat> for uh, or more. Like user cluster, we need same like three machines. Uh, which is running on Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, and uh, we need 2 GB or more RAM per machine, same. Like in master, we use 4 GB, and uh, in user cluster, we uh, uh, need 2 GB or more. Uh, then we need two CPUs or more for uh, user cluster, and uh, all the nodes have full network capacity between all machines in the cluster, and uh, we need a unique host name, make address, and product UIT for every node. And uh, so, uh, swap is mostly disabled in uh, in your uh, node. You must uh, disable the swap in order of Kubernetes to work properly. Like uh, if you want to uh, check the product UIT, you can go through this path like sudo cat cys class dmi id products. You got the product UIT. Yeah, uh, for the uh, network adapter, uh, if you have more than one network adapter and uh, our Kubernetes cluster are not reachable in the default route, uh, we recommended you and I uh, recommended you add IP routes so Kubernetes cluster address go by the appropriate adapters. The 
required uh, uh, required ports for our master cluster we use protocol for uh, tcp protocols for all the all purposes uh, like uh, uh, direction we need inbound direction and the port range which is mentioned here like for kubernetes uh, kubernetes api server we use 6443 port and this port are default uh, like etcd server client api we use 2379 to 2380 for kubelet api we, uh, we use 10250 port uh, for kube scheduler we use 10251 port uh, for kube controller manager we use 10252 and for read only kubelet api we use 10255 uh, for our worker node uh, we use same protocol tcp protocol and uh, direction all we use inbound and the port range is like for kubelet api we use 10250 and uh, read only kubelet api we use 10255 and for node port service you we use 30000 to 32767 uh, any port number which is marked uh, marked with star like here kubelet api server uh, are overridable so we will need to ensure any custom ports uh, which are provided are also open for all your uh, uh, ports for com complete uh come to the complete infra specification uh like we need some uh, need some specific uh, need something like uh, if for user account we uh, user account in vpn uh, we use three type of uh, environments for our application like dev uat and production we need three different user accounts and three different vpn accounts for uh, our application the user roles we need to give admin and deploy read only for all environments uh, then os we use uh, any type of linux but we preferably use ubuntu and red hat uh, like kubernetes as a managed service or vms uh, provision managed kubernetes service with with, uh, with a uh, hn drs and our vms with we need two core we two core 4 gb ram and 20 uh, 20 gb disk ssd if no one managed KHS, we need three VMs uh, for environment. For dev, we need three VMs, UAT and prod also we need three VMs as a master node. And as a worker node, we need four core VM and 16 GB RAM and 20 GB disk for environment. Like uh, we in dev, we need three VMs for uh, worker in UAT four and in production, we need four VMs. For storage, uh, we need storage with backups, snaps and dynamic uh, things which are enabled in that storage we need one tv for uh, our environment like dev we need one tv and uat we need 800 gb and uh, production we need 1500 gb and next uh vm in uh, vm instance uh max throw output 750 for mbps for all uh, environment dev and uat in production for storage we need max throw output 1000 mbp uh, mb per second and uh, internet speed we need minimum 100 mbps to 1000 mbps per second and next we need public ip nat or uh, not put load balancing internet facing one public ip for uh, per environment we need three ips for dev and uh, uat and production and uh, next availability we use uh, vms from the different region uh, for our application we need at least two region and about the private LAN per environment, all VMs should within private LAN. Like we three need three private LAN for our application. And uh, next part like gateway, uh, we use net gateway, internet gateway, payment and SMS gateway, etc. Uh, we need per one gateway per environment. Uh, the, then the firewall <coughs> available to configure inbound and outbound ports rule uh, earlier we discussed about the uh, port rules uh, for our uh, application which we need able to configure inbound and outbound port rules uh, manage database like we use postgres 12 and evoke for the uh, db with backup snapshot and logging access and as per SDC, we need one VM with four core, 16 GB RAM and 100 GB disk per environment. Like uh, Dev, we need one VM and UAT will need one uh, also one VM. For production, we need two VMs. And uh, for our uh, CI CD pipeline, 
hosted manage, management we need a self hosted jenkin like uh, we need one master and one slave node uh, which is configured with 4 4 core and 8 gb and if you use on cloud you use manage uh, nic devops and aws cloud deploy and azure devops for the nexus repository it uh, we need self hosted artifactory repo nic nexus artifactory one for one environment and uh, docker registry we, we need one docker uh, docker registry for our application it will use in dev u18 production git source code we need a uh, git or uh, any source uh, source code control tool which you, you are aware of uh, we need one github git account for this uh, then dns main domain and ability to add uh, more subdomains and SSL certificate for SSL certificate, NIC managed or SDC managed SSL certificate for our for per URL. We need two URLs for like one SSL certificate for your application and another one is for your Jenkins and other uh, Jenkins and other like monitoring part and all. Yeah. Ajay, uh, just complete. I done Sure. So I know. Uh... We've looked at the specificities of, uh, from an infra point of view, how much would you need for each VM? I think uh, we, Ashutosh, we also have an infra calculator, right? Is that uh, currently ported on the docs website? Yeah. I think that'll be a useful tool for everyone. It's similar to how you would need resource requirement depending on the scale of the project. You can also look at the infra requirement and how that scales up depending on what the scope of implementation is. I think Ashutosh can share that too. Sumit, your comment is noted. Ajay, can you please the link? I should have the link. I can share that across as well. Oh, there. Uh, let me just... One second. I hope there's the right link. Yeah. Can yeah, I talk okay. a minute about this, Ashutosh? Yeah. Uh, for backbone services, we use like uh, Redis, Zookeeper, Ingenious Ingress, Sort Manager for our uh, uh, SSL. You use Sort Manager, then ES Data Infra, ES Master Infra, ES Data, then ES Master Kafka, Kafka Infra, and Postgres DB. For our uh, infra requirement, we use Jagger, Kivana Infra, uh, Kivana Product, Menu, Grafana for our monitoring. Alert Manager, Prometheus, and uh, WordPress portal. For any uh, core core thing, we need uh, EGov ENS service and EGov Searcher. These are the all EGov uh, services like PG service, file store for storing all the detail, all the things of application and uh, Joule. Uh, then EGov notification mail, uh, EGov notification SMS, EGov localization. These things are all EGov services which you use and uh, egov mdms service uh, egov indexer egov report egov workflow then uh, egov user event pdf services and egov.pdf these are the services which you use and uh, so i think the yeah. core idea of this is to look at uh, once you have uh, to get let's say an implementation done, which services need to be up and running depending on the scope. For example, you can see BPA and all of these are specific implementation with specific scopes. So depending on which module you need to be up, uh, that particular service and the number of pods for that service needs to be up. So you can calculate the infra for each service. You think this is a template, I think for reference, which uh, should be available on docs as well. If not, we'll make it available. So that when you're calculating infra, depending on the services that you need for your specific implementation modules to be up, you can calculate that and then configure the infra accordingly. So that's the entire idea. So basically the way eager works is we have almost, I'll just stop sharing my screen for one second. 
So we've almost uh, templatized most of the process in terms of resource requirements to creating, configuring, and customizing the modules to infra requirements to let's say even the program governance piece. So we have templatized the entire process of how do you uh, do a more mature e-governance implementation. We've added our own enablement and support to it. This is why I think partners have had a lot of success and even the states have had a lot of success implementing an open source solution, which is what you generally don't see in the market. I think as pointed earlier, there will always be an enterprise version with support. That's the base model, which generally works, I think in the markets so that at least the support clause is maintained or uh, there is some confidence in uh, an enterprise software versus an open source software. So that's a gap that we've been able to bridge by the entire templatization and the process and the documentation that we do, which you would have already seen is fairly comprehensive. So this session, I think, gave you an overview about eGov Digit, gave you an overview about how we run our program governance, what kind of templates that we've created and the documents that we have, and should be a good starting point for you or your team to also understand how we engage our work, being a nonprofit in the technology space in India across, I think, missions which are fairly critical, where you need a public digital good interventions because markets are essentially not catering for these a uh, lot of these implementations. Hence, I think it, the role that we play, it also gives you an understanding of what exactly are we trying to solve. Because at the end of the day, we are not just looking to implement a particular solution. We would want the service to reach the citizen. Hence, we also extensively work with a lot of civil society partners. We also do monitoring and evaluation as part of a program so that the citizens and the municipal employees are getting the benefit that they would actually need by a digitization program rather than just doing digitization for the sake of digitization and working with multiple actors across the ecosystems from state governments to central governments to achieve this common vision of ensuring that you can actually improve ease of life of citizens in India. So I hope this was super useful. And if there are any other further queries, I think I'll just drop my email here as well. And yeah, you can feel free to reach out to me. Meanwhile, I'm also launching uh, one second. Uh, Abhishek, can you launch the survey? Uh, the survey will be sent out to all the attendees. Okay, perfect. So we'll be sending out a survey after the session.